um, what I'm going to speak about is uh, the topic is a long one. It's, it has to do with the complexation of fatty acids, calcium cations, and polysaccharides at the sea surface microlayer and their application to chemical hurting of oil spills and sea spray aerosols. And I would not, I would be negligent not to say that um, my student that is working on this, Luis Macias, um, who has taken a lot of the most recent data and done a lot of the analysis is, is one fabulous student. And so he truly deserves to be on the, the first page, the first slide. Um, so let me begin. I thought the best way to begin is to talk about um, the reasons for studying this topic. Um, I think that's sort of important because um, the topic is important in a number of areas, and two of them are the ones that uh, particularly motivate our study. Um, so I thought I'd tell you about those first. I think it's always more interesting to understand what the motivations for a person's study are, as well as the details. So the motivations for this study, there are really two of them. One is um, the process of chemical herding of oil spills on the sea surface. And the second is the composition of sea spray aerosols. And I thought I'd spend a, at least a little bit more time than usual on the first one, which is chemical herding of oil spills. And the reason is when I first got into this, which is now about six years ago, um, I had no idea about this process. And I think we all the times talk about Marangoni forces and amplophiles and surfactants and spreading, but never on these large scales that are important for chemical herding. And I was I was actually amazed that Marangoni forces were being used um, for the remediation of oil spills, and that they had been for for nearly a decade. So, um, if you bear with me, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that. I think it's interesting and sort of invites the rest of the study. So what you're looking at uh, on the slide in front of you is a light hydrocarbon oil spill on the sea surface. And what I'd like you to see from that picture is a couple of things. One is that there are gradations in color and or darkness and lightness. And those gradations have to do with the thickness of the spill. So at this point, the spill has reached a quasi steady state in terms of its spreading. And the center region, which is the darkest, is typically of the order of millimeters in size and thickness. And then that thickness decreases as you go to the edges through the micron scales. And finally, the sheens that you see at the very edges at the periphery, those are actually submicron in thickness. This bill was a picture that was taken from a part of the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, I guess now 10 years, 10 years ago. So the first question you ask with this is um, when a spill occurs, it occurs very quickly in the sense of how it spreads over the surface. And you ask, why does this crude oil spread so quickly over the sea surface? And to answer that question, um, I put in, hold on a second. I just want to make sure the movie plays. Okay, so to answer that question, I first give you this small demonstration. Um, and these, um, this particular uh, setup, we're going to use later on in the talk once we investigate the properties of the complexation. But here I just wanted to uh, show you the how rapidly oil spreads over the surface, and then we'll go through the reasons. So the experiment is, is, is a very simple one. In this Teflon trough that's milled, and it's about 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters and about um, several millimeters in depth, we put an aqueous subphase. And then we hang a ring, a Teflon ring, and float it over the surface, on top of the surface. And then we place the crude oil um, onto, into the inside of that Teflon ring. Um, we wait for the crude oil to spread uniformly in the ring, and then we pull the ring up. 
and we watch what happens with the video camera that's on the top. And so this is um, this project was originally funded from the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative, GOMRI. And so we were interested in using the crudes that were coming from uh, Louisiana. And so this is a Louisiana sweet crude. And we measure the interfacial tensions and so forth, the properties of the crude density, viscosity. But what I'd like you to just see is what, what happens and how quickly it happens. So um, we pull the ring up and immediately you see over a few seconds that the oil rapidly spreads on this aqueous subphase. Now this subphase is, is pure millipore water. You can do the experiments with sea salt as well. It always looks um, exactly the same. Sometimes because the spreading is not symmetrical, little holes appear and then these heal in time so that the oil is uniformly spread. So you see that when um, an oil spill occurs on a sea surface, it spreads out rapidly. And physically what's seen is it spreads out very rapidly, it starts to evaporate. And then because the evaporation makes the liquid film that's on the surface, floating on the surface, more viscous, that really slows down the process. It never really arrests it, but it slows it down till this thick gunk of oil is uh, laying on the surface of seawater. Now, why it spreads so quickly is clear in this slide is I try to make clear in this slide here. So um, I guess everybody can see my cursor. Right? So here is um, the oil slick, which is laying on the surface of the water subphase on the sea surface. And I'm going to talk um, in a little while about the unique um, bacterial community that lies underneath the air, uh, the air sea surface right at the uh, at the edge. But don't worry about that right now. That's indicated in this yellowish orange color. But when the oil lens is placed on the surface, there is a balance of surface tension forces at the periphery that is famous in interfacial phenomena um, and is usually um, used to understand how smaller things, smaller bodies of liquid spread on surfaces. But here it's on a much larger scale, but it's still um, the main actuating force. So the air sea surface, gamma C here, it typically has values of 55 to 65 millinewtons per meter. And I'll talk about why it's not 72 in, in a little while. The oil air tensions are usually around 25 to 28. And the oil water tensions are in the 20s up to about 27. So what happens is, is this floating, by, floating body sits on the surface, there is an imbalance of forces that's measured traditionally in interfacial phenomena with the spreading coefficient, the difference between the sea tension and the oil water and oil tensions. So the oil water and the oil are trying to re retract the slick and the sea tension is pulling out. And if you go through the numbers here, you see that typically what happens is because the sea tension is very high, it's larger than the sum of these two. And that's what causes the oil slick to sort of spread out over the surface. And then as I've said, as it spreads out, um, it evaporates, it solidifies, the viscosity increases, and that slows it down. But in fact, the balance of forces doesn't really change all that much. It still remains in favor of gamma C that constantly uh, tries to pull the slick out. It's just the viscous forces of the thin layer then resist it more effectively. Now, um, there are many methods for um, re you know, uh, remediating this spill. The ones that you always hear about um, that I had always heard about was using an encircling boom. So in that case, you have a boom that's logistically placed around the spill and um, it sort of is compressed by the boom into a smaller region. So these booms are very, very specifically designed not to let the oil slip from underneath it. And so this is a process that um, is being shown here. This is not, this is an Alaskan oil spill. Um, once it's sort of 
compressed to a given uh, amount, then two things occur. One is either uh, uh, boats are then used to siphon the oil off of the localized spill now that's no longer spreading and no longer moving along the ocean surface because of the booms. Or what's now being done is um, these ignition packs are then sprayed onto, the ignition pack packets are, are sprayed by, by uh, airplane onto the surface of this lens and uh, they ignite the oil and the oil is burned off. And that right now, uh, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, which sort of regulates these things, is the preferred method uh, for removing an oil spill that has sort of been um, brought together by a boom. And this is a picture of um, an oil spill that's being burnt in a wave tank at the Cold Regions Research Laboratory. And we have a collaboration with them on the design of these surfactants that we're talking about, that I'll talk to you about. Um, the second is the one that was used in the Gulf of Mexico, the, the oil spill, and that was dispersants. And so in dispersants, you begin to use surface chemistry to sort of um, remove or ameliorate the oil spill. And in this case, a surfactant is dissolved in an applicator solvent, and that solvent is soluble in the oil that is floating on the surface. So it dissolves into the oil and then the surfactant is designed to reduce the oil water tension at the bottom periphery of the floating lens. When it reduces that tension to low enough value, wave action typically breaks or disperses the lens into these small uh, droplets of oil. And then these droplets are carried through the ocean and microbes break the oil down in order to complete the remediation. And this is a long process. It could take several weeks, um, several, a few days to just emulsify and then weeks uh, for the microbes to break up. But the idea is that you don't let the slick stay intact where it can then sort of a lot of times go to the coastline where it causes the most damage. So both of these processes are intended for that, for that aim. And um, until a decade ago, this is basically the two um, technologies in the toolkit for fighting um, an oil spill. Now, the way that the, the technique that we're going to talk about that motivated this whole study of uh, complexation of polysaccharides, uh, calcium cations, and amphiphiles onto the surface, on the surface, is chemical herding. And so what you do in chemical herding is, instead of spraying a surfactant that's intended to emulsify the oil directly on the spill and not using boats to cordon off the, um, the spill, you spray a surfactant whose purpose is to lower the air-sea tension and affect the balance of forces. And so I think it's completely clear what the aim is. When the surfactant, which is again sprayed like a dispersant around the periphery of the oil slick, it lowers the surface tension, gamma uh, C. And because it lowers gamma C, it takes you from a regime in which gamma C was greater than the sum of the oil and the water oil tensions, which led to spreading, a positive spreading coefficient, to the case where gamma C is now less than that sum, in which case the forces at the periphery cause the oil lens to retract upon itself. And so this oil lens will retract upon itself to a thickness where um, everything is of the order of a few millimeters or more. And at that point, that thickness allows you to burn the slick. So without the need of any, um, you know, any booms around it, you can compress and burn the spill. And so uh, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement is very interested in developing this chemical herding technology. And you can see immediately as it's described where all this business comes from of why I'm interested in amphiphiles, um, polysaccharides, 
and cations. I guess polysaccharides, it's not yet clear as to why they play such an important role, but um, I'll speak about that in a minute. So um, in the experiments that I'm gonna talk about, one of the, the two things we've been working on that's critical is that the current surfactants in the arsenal are um, for chemical hurting are not eco-friendly. And the second is that the monolayer is not stable on the surface wave turbulence. And let me just give you a hint of that. Uh, over the past decade, OP40 has been um, the chemical herder of choice in these small oil spills. And this is what it looks like. And it's kind of, it is very effective in that it can lower the surface tension of the air sea surface to be uh, low enough that the spreading coefficient can become substantially negative. So there's no problem with its surface tension reducing abilities. But the problem with OP40 and a few of the others is that it's not eco-friendly. You see these uh, so-called siloxane bonds here for the hydrophobic group. So this hydrophobic group gives it a strong amphilicity. It's like a super spreader in the way that it's structured. It's not a super spreader, but in the way it's structured. And because it's polymeric in size, it, it lasts and, and resists breakup uh, on the ocean surface, especially when there's wave turbulence. But the siloxane linkages are difficult to so-called digest in the marine biota. And one of the things I've learned in, in doing this project is how sensitive um, the balance of things are in, in a marine environment. And so most of the tests that are done on this are not favorable, but this was used in the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, in any case, because they had no choice. Now, the chemical herding was not used for the big parts of the spill, but then there were these small localized regions that they did use this technology for the first time, but not on a large scale. The second thing, and I think what's sort of interesting because it brings up hydrodynamics and everything, is the idea that when the spill occurs on the surface, on the sea surface, there is still subjects to turbulence. Now, an oil layer calms the sea ocean, but even so, um, there is always some turbulence going on. And so that tends to break up the, the monolayer that's spread around it. So here is the so-called herding monolayer whose objective is to lower the air-sea tension. And that monolayer will extend you know, uh, millimeters around the periphery. And because of the ocean turbulence, that monolayer is not always very stable. And because of that, um, it can break up and the hurting action can be eliminated. So our objectives, if I go back, are were two were to develop an eco-friendly surfactant. And secondly, to understand how to develop a surfactant that is not only eco-friendly, but somehow can be resilient in the face of wave turbulence. And to understand how to do that, um, you have to take a more critical issue of what the sea surface microlayer looks like before you start deciding what surfactants to use and then you know, understanding the properties of those surfactants. So that was the main, and I know I took probably way too much time for that, but. I, I sort of think it's important sometimes that the motivation and why we're interested in these things can ignite for people that are listening to this talk, maybe other things, other clues that they might be interested in. Um, so I'm gonna say only now a few more words about the second motivation, which is the one that's evolving and that's the so-called sea spray aerosols and the composition. So I think everyone knows if you go to the beach or the, the ocean, that as um, breaking waves, uh, as waves break on the seashore, they uh, entrain air bubbles. And then these air bubbles rise and they burst, releasing a sea spray aerosol. And that's the hiss that you usually see, and you see the aerosols at the, uh, at the edge of the ocean. And the composition of those aerosols, as you might imagine, looking at the central picture here, is dictated totally by what is the amphiphilic nature, what are the kinds of amphiphiles that are at the air-sea surface, and then how they become trapped as the bubble pushes through, breaches through the surface, 
and forms the droplets. Now these droplets composed of whatever it picked up from the sea surface here, then dry and the composition of those droplets, uh, the composition of the dry particles that are carried through the troposphere is directly determined by the physical chemistry of this layer right here. And these particles are extremely important. They scatter incoming soil irradiation. As I think everybody's aware of, they serve as cloud condensation nuclei, nuclei and ice nucleating particles. So to determine their, and all those properties are a function of their composition. So if we could have a handle on how the composition of the sea surface determines the composition of these particles, then we can go a long way in predicting um, uh, problem spots, um, things like blooms where uh, the compositions can change. Um, so that's a, the second is what we're working on, we're starting to work on right now. The chemical herding is the one that we've been working on for the last few years. So all of these, um, I think, sort of should excite your interest in what the sea surface really looks like. And that was a revelation for me. And so that's why I thought I'd talk to you a little bit more about the so-called sea surface microlayer, which a lot of people have studied for a number of reasons. But I think um, those that are involved a lot of times in interfacial chemistry, and academic ones where we measure adsorption of surfactants at air water surfaces and Langmuir troughs, and even X-ray reflectivity, we have no idea of the nuances that are at the air sea surface. Um, so this is sort of a picture which summarizes what's going on at the air sea surface. And to one point, I just want to get the pronunciation right. Um, so there is a layer about a millimeter in thick. So it's not, I'm not talking about the interfacial zone, which would be nanometers. I'm talking about this layer just at the air sea surface that's called the sea surface microlayer. It is about a millimeter in thickness. And it is the home of a bacterial community that's called Neustin, N-E-U-S-T-O-N, Neustin. Uh, I gave this talk somewhere else where there were people from Woods Hole and I totally butchered the name of that, so I'm trying to keep it. And um, the community consists a lot of phytoplankton like diatoms and green algae. And what they tend to do is they, their degradation products or after they die and all, they end up at the air sea immediate interface. So the immediate interface is consists of what we call marine amphiphiles that have absorbed. And I'll tell you a few of them in which the most prominent ones. But the other thing is they secrete polysaccharides. And these polysaccharides, uh, and I'll go through some of those, in combination with the amphiphiles that are at the ASC surface, sometimes can give a gelatinous look almost to that surface. Sometimes if you look at the ARC surface, you can see that it looks a little bit gelatin-like. And that's because of a complexation that's forming between these polysaccharides that are in reasonably high concentrations at the sea surface due to this secretion by the, by the phytoplankton, the marine amphiphiles themselves, and then, of course, sea salt that's present uh, in the sea surface microlayer. So it is the sea surface microlayer layer that really governs the composition of the air sea surface. And different seas and different environments generate different environments for the Neusosin and different concentrations and types of polysaccharides. So if we sample the sea surface microlayer, and it's not as difficult to do because it's a millimeter in thickness, and we get an idea of its composition, then we would like to understand from that composition, what could we expect for aerosol particles? And what kind of surfactants could uniquely interact in order to get a herding formulation? So the types of um, surfactants that we're looking at um, will be the fatty acids. So palmitic acid, which is shown here, has a 16 carbon backbone carboxylic acid. 
it is the fatty acid with the highest percentage in both the microlayer and observations at directly at the air sea surface at that at the interface. Um, there are other fatty acids that are also present, and I'm going to call your attention to one of them that's called phytanic acid. And the reason that it is important is that it is the same 16 carbon backbone, but it has methyl groups attached every four carbons. It's called an isoprenoid. And um, it is present in um, the thylakoid membranes, chloroplasts. So it's an eco-friendly um, material. But the most important contribution is, of course, palmitic acid that we'll talk about. The other thing that I thought was interesting to tell you all about is that at the sea surface, there are the usual candidate lipids, DPPC and so forth. But what are equally as important in the, in the C microlayer are the glycolipids. So the glycolipids have a similar structure as regular lipids. They have uh, these two chains, typically unsaturated, but the head group is not uh, serine or so forth. It is uh, a sugar ring. And so that's this one here is called MGDG, monogalactodiacylglycerol. And what is important about this is that the it is not charged, okay? Whereas the fatty acids are typically charged, so the pH of seawater is, is high. It's usually around eight or so. So the carboxylic acid is typically uh, negatively charged. And it, even if it wasn't that high, it would be negatively charged because of the presence of the cations in the subface, particularly calcium. So I'm going to leave you with that. What we're going to be looking at are um, biomolecules that are the glycolipids. I want to focus on them. And on the contrast between the straight chain hydrocarbon palmitic acid and a possible candidate for herding phytanic acid, which has this distinctly uh, branched methyl chain. And I just want to remind you also of the sea salts. So this is the typical composition in the sea and the highlighted calcium and magnesium. So magnesium is of the order of 50 millimolar and calcium is of the order of 10 millimolar. And once again, the pH is usually 7.5 to 8. Um, this was just to, uh, I won't go into detail. These are just the chloroplasts of, uh, um, they are, that are used for photosynthesis. And you find that that's where the majority of the glycolipid is present in the membranes of the chloroplasts. And phytanic acid is one of the most important of the fatty acids that houses the machinery for uh, photosynthesis. Okay, and lastly, the polysaccharides that I'll talk about. So the polysaccharides are um, the ones I want to look at um, are one from red algae and one from br uh, brown algae. And we'll be concentrating on the bottom one, which is from red algae and is uh, one of the carrageenans, the lambda carrageenan. The carrageenans are um, very common in food science for as thickeners. But here we're going to use their natural appearance in the sea surface microlayer in order to understand this complexation and furthermore, how it can impact herding and sea spray aerosols. And the thing I wanted to point out about the lambda carotene from the start is that it's, it's negatively charged because of these SO3 minus groups that hang from the edge. In the case of brown algae, alginate, which we won't talk about, although we started to do experiments on that, it's the carboxylate that, um, that gives uh, the negative charge. So the idea I want to put in your um, heads is the following, that on the sea surface, you have floating these marine amphiphiles of which the carboxylic acids, the fatty acids are the most important, they're typically negatively charged. You have calcium at 10 millimolar present, and obviously it's a divalent cation. And finally, you have the polysaccharides present, and they are negatively uh, charged. So you have negative charge in the sea surface microlayer, negative charge for the amphiphiles at the surface, and the potential for bridging between them by the calcium which is naturally present in the sea. 
So this is what we're going to focus on, is this complexation between the fatty acids that are floating on the surface and their possible modification from straight chain to branched with phytanic acid. The calcium as a divalent bridging cation, and finally the charged biopolymer, i.e. the polysaccharide. So you start, as always, with um, looking at the fundamentals with a surface pressure area curve or a, a pie curve. And the pie curves, on first looking at them, described a wealth of information when we started to compare palmitic acid, which has, of course, been known since um, the experiments of Langmuir and, and, and uh, Davies and Rydell and so forth, in the early part of the 20th century. But when you go from that to just adding those branches to the isoponoid tail, you see a big, big difference. And that difference has important consequences for the type of um, surfactant we would use as a chemical herder. So on the left here, whoops, sorry. On the left is the surface pressure area per molecule isotherm for palmitic acid. Um, the blue is in pure water, and the red is in artificial seawater. Artificial seawater has the same composition, typical composition of seawater. Um, and then we'll also look, instead of looking at um, seawater itself, we'll look at uh, individually calcium and magnesium in the subphase. So here is palmitic acid. It shows in pure water the typical um, behavior of a liquid condensed state and then a liquid solid state as the monolayer is compressed and then a collapse that's called a constant area collapse in which um, layers build on top of one another to accommodate the increasingly smaller area per molecule. So there's nothing new here. There is also nothing new. A few people have taken what happens when the subphase contains, instead of pure water, artificial seawater, or ASW. And there you see a small contraction for the very low surface pressures. But at any reasonable surface pressure, there is an expansion of the monolayer. And in addition, the collapse, instead of being this constant area breakdown collapse, becomes what is known as constant pressure, in which one layer then builds over another layer rather than a bunch of layers form. Okay. Um, if you look just below it, uh, we tease out um, just looking at calcium, magnesium, and pure water. And for the rest of these slides, um, what I'll look at is only either calcium in the subphase or magnesium in the subphase or the combination of the two before talking about polysaccharides. And basically the calcium is one that seems to cause the contraction and then expansion at higher surface pressures. But the uh, magnesium always um, gives an expansion. So when the two of those are added together in just heuristically speaking, it's probably the calcium that gives a small contraction, just attributing it and then the magnesium and calcium effect at the high surface pressures gives the expansion. And that's all summarized, summarized here. And like I said, a lot of this data has already been taken before. But now picture the right-hand side. This is now phytanic acid. So phytanic acid has the same backbone, but has methyl groups every four carbons away. And so you know that when they are compressed together, they're not gonna wanna get as close to each other and that's why the, typically the areas per molecule before the collapse are a lot larger. But something else develops that's super important in terms of stability. And that is that the layer is liquid. It is not, it doesn't have this sharp liquid condensed, liquid solid transition, that palmitic acid, which is more tightly packed. The presence of the methyl groups makes this monolayer fluid-like. And so you see, um, this rather smooth increase. And in addition, without doing anything except putting those methyl terminal groups, you see the collapse behavior, all this in pure water, 
pure, blue is pure water in both of these, becomes constant pressure collapse. And so as the material collapses, um, what happens is one layer forms and then another layer, bilayer forms on top of it, all in a smooth manner. So looking at these two, we got the first inkling that if we wanted to use for herding and form a more stable monolayer, then we certainly wouldn't use palmitic acid. We would kind of like to use phytanic because it forms a more liquid layer on the surface. The behavior in the presence of ions is similar as in palmitic, although I'll show you some differences when we look at the x-ray. And that is that, um, once again, you see generally an expansion here for all surface pressures. And um, in the case of calcium and magnesium, calcium does a contraction at first, and then an expansion for, um, and then an expansion at higher pressures, and magnesium is always expansive. So the reasons for expansion and contraction sometimes are convoluted. They have to do with, first of all, the fact that calcium typically, because of its coordination, ionizes the monolayer and the ionization causes an expansion. But calcium can also bridge between two carboxylates and that causes a contraction. So these competing effects of ionization and repulsion and contraction due to divalent coupling are the reasons for this complicated behavior. And sometimes it's difficult to tease um, the two of them out. And I should point out here, all this is at a pH right around 5.5. Uh, now, the, when uh, my student Luis was doing experiments at Argonne, he was also made privy to some other experiments that were done on palmitic acid. And that was also um, in agreement with some other things we found. So palmitic is really not a very stable monolayer. And we did these experiments on what are called langmuir blodgett transfer films. And a langmuir blodgett transfer film is one in which you bring the monolayer to a certain pressure here, 30 millinewtons per meter. And then you pull a, um, a silica surface uh, perpendicular, a cut, a small rectangle through the interface and allow it to dry. So what you do is you basically pick the palmitic acid monolayer off of the Langmuir trough and allow it to absorb down on top of the silica surface and look at what the structure looks like. And what we found was that at a pressure of 30 millinewtons, which is above the transition here, um, and this is all in pure water, that the monolayer, uh, and we then looked at it under an atomic force microscope, the monolayer basically fractured into pieces. And if you do careful analysis of the thickness of these layers, you'll see that basically this is one layer on top of another layer on top of another layer. So palmitic acid is not, does not form, it's a fragile monolayer. And there were some other experiments that were done in Argonne that showed also this, this fragility. Um, one of the other ways you see it is that if you compress palmitic acid to a certain area per molecule, right? So you compress it to that area per molecule and then keep it at that area you'll find that uh, eventually, um, and keep it at that surface pressure, you'll find that the area continues to contract and contract and contract. And the reason for that is that the monolayer is collapsing. If you add, um, like in artificial seawater, then if you look at the behavior here where now you have constant pressure collapse. We found that the langmuir blodgett films were more stable in the sense that there was a uniform thickness. But at a higher surface pressure, even those in artificial seawater broke apart into pieces. So the, the takeaway from our experiments on using AFM to get a molecular level detail of the monolayer by sort of picking it off the surface um, showed that palmitic was not very stable. And even though it was more stable when uh, the cations were present in the subface, particularly in this case, it was just all of them, artificial seawater, um, even at high surface pressures, it wasn't. And so these investigations with the pie curve here 
sort of told us that uh, palmitic acid would not be the best one for chemical hurting. Phytanic acid, on the other hand, turned out to be an extraordinarily stable molecule because of that liquid state. And so when we did the same experiments on langmuir blodgett transfer films using phytanic acid, we found that the layers were very uniform, both at 15 and at 30 millinewtons per meter. And the holes in these layers, which are usually used to gauge what the thickness is of the layer, showed that it was one monolayer thick. So that's why phytanic acid turned out um, to be, I guess, the molecular difference between phytanic and palmitic um, gave an extraordinary difference in, the, in basically the, the fluidity of the surface and also in terms of the stability of the surface. So we thought to use phytanic, and I, I don't have time to show MGDG, which was the glycolipid that had similar properties as this. So that uh, brought us to think, well, let's then use um, X-ray reflectivity and X-ray refluorescence um, to understand what the concentrations of these materials are and further to then start looking at polysaccharides as well. And so we did the typical experiments where on a Langmuir trough, you compress the layer and by compressing the layer to a certain surface pressure, which here will be 15 millinewtons per meter, we measured um, the X-ray reflectivity. So the RF over, uh, R over RF as a function of the momentum wave vector. And from that and modeling uh, using Pratt model fits of different slabs, we're able to get the electron density profile at the surface. And this I think everyone's familiar with. And from that electron density profile, we can then understand what the concentration is of the surfactant, the associated water, the calcium, and if we add polysaccharides as well. Um, the calcium comes directly from the, from the measurements of the fluorescence. So there are a couple of um, things that we found from this, and uh, I'm gonna summarize them very quickly. The first was that the, um, the presence, so here is the reflectivity curves as a function of QZ. And you see that we usually start with phytanic acid on pure water. As the calcium is then added, so the calcium is added to 10 millimolar, which is the concentration in seawater we found in this orange an increase in the reflectivity, so an increase indicating that the calcium had absorbed or bound to the phytanic acid. And then we did the same experiments with Mg, with magnesium, and with magnesium and calcium as well. What we found that was interesting is you might say, well, what happened with palmitic? Is that palmitic never formed stable layers to begin with, in order for us to do these kinds of experiments. Now in the future, we're gonna to try to do some experiments with palmitic and polysaccharides, but the layers were just not stable enough um, in the presence of just the calcium at reasonable surface pressures in order to do these. But the phytanic acid was like a new model for this and it was quite stable and allowed us to, to do these experiments. The pie curves, are just shown here in reference. And so I just wanna always keep pointing out that we took the surface pressure, we held the surface pressure at 15 when they did these reflectivities. And we computed the electron density profile, which is shown here. But the most important information then um, is given here. And I'll just briefly go over what we seem to have found. The first thing we found is that um, if we look at the concentration of the surfactant, it agrees remarkably well with the concentrations that you measure directly from the Plie curves. And so that was a very satisfying feature of these experiments. And so you see that the, the, expansion of the, the expansion of the layer in the presence of the magnesium and the calcium at 15 millinewtons per meter, or for their mixture for that matter, is clearly shown here in the Plie curve and the calculated values are practically on the nose in terms of their area per molecules. So the pure, pure water was 43.78 calculated. And I think it was something like uh, 44 or 44.5 uh, 
in terms of doing the experiment, the pi a curve, and the same thing is also true for um, the other measurements as well. So it correctly predicts, for example, the contraction in the layer when calcium is added and the expansion when you have magnesium or magnesium and calcium. So that was, um, that was quite satisfying. When it came to the measurements of how much calcium was on the surface or how much magnesium was on the surface, our preliminary results seem to indicate that there was calcium was bridging. And that is, we found that there were 0.6 molecules of calcium per molecule of, um, of uh, phytanic acid, or in other words, two phytanics per one calcium. And we believe this result uh, sort of is the reason why you have this condensation uh, or reduction in uh, the area per molecule as the things are, are sort of drawn together. Magnesium did not behave anywhere like that. In the case of magnesium, we found, first of all, that there was more a higher concentration of magnesium than calcium when it was there alone, but that was partially due to the fact that the concentration was 50 millimolar, and the reason for that is that's the concentration in seawater. But the important conclusion is that phytanic acid on Mg cations showed a one-to-one -one bonding ratio rather than a uh, two to one, two surfactants to one calcium. So there is a difference in how each one of them interacts. And a lot of that has to do with the difference between an electrostatic binding and a more coordination binding. But I'm not gonna talk that much about that. I wanted to get on, because I see that I'm rapidly running out of time. I'll try to just wrap up in five minutes um, because I spent too much time on the intro but that's okay. I wanted to tell you what happens next when you add uh, lambda carrageenan. And so these are the surface pressure isotherms. The green is for pure water. We've already seen that for phytanic acid. And next you add underneath the surface lambda carrageenan. So the presence of the carrageenan alters the Baillet curve. Not greatly, but it does alter it indicating there is some interaction of the carrageenan with the phytanic acid. Now remember the phytanic acid is either negatively charged or at pH 5.5, which are these experiments, only partially charged, but it would be negative. And of course, lambda carrageenan is permanently negatively charged. So the interactions are weak, maybe between hydrogen bonding and so forth. And that's why the curves don't look all that much different. However, once you put calcium into the subphase here at 10 millimolar and the lambda carrageenan, and this is all at, I don't think I mentioned it, 0.15 weight percent. And we're looking again at 15 for the surface pressure. You find that there is a big expansion in the monolayer. And then again, using all the uh, X-ray reflectivity, we found that that expansion is exactly predicted by the modeling. So the expansion went from pure water under pure water of 43 angstrom squared per molecule to 50.3 angstrom squared per molecule. So that part was satisfying in that we knew we were sort of capturing all the physics. So we use the concentration of uh, the surfactant, the amplophile at the surface to be sort of our verification that we're doing the modeling correctly because we get the same areas per molecule that you get directly from the pi a curve. So once we knew that, and that was the same thing in the case with just calcium or magnesium in the subphase, we then go to calculate the concentration of the lambda carrageenan and the concentration in the calcium in the subway. And we find uh, these remarkable facts. The first is that the surface coverage of calcium increases from 30% to 75% with lambda carrageenan. But more importantly, um, there's an increment of 300% of lambda carrageenan absorbed to the surface with calcium. So if you have a phytanic uh, monolayer and you add calcium, and then you add, uh, and you have calcium and carrageenan, 
the calcium recruits the lambda carrageenan into the surface in large measure. And that's probably due to that divalent coupling that I talked about slides ago. And so um, that's basically the mechanism by what's going on at the sea surface, that fatty acids that are negatively charged couple with lambda carrageenan that is recruited to the surface through the calcium. And so the concentration in that immediate interface, the air water surface, is quite enriched with lambda carrageenan because of the presence of, presence of the calcium. Okay. And that's one of our major conclusions. And I think um, what we're happy about is we think that we have measures of the concentration of the carrageenan on the surface um, that are direct measures which you cannot get from the surface pressure measurements. And I think from that, you could start inferring a lot. Now, this was at one concentration of lambda carrageenan, but you could do it at others. And so you're beginning to see that what we think is that using the X-ray reflectivity technique, that we can have some idea of what the concentration is at the air water surface of carrageenan as a function of its bulk concentration, which would be characteristic of where what sea surface you're looking at. And that would be indicative of how much carrageenan would be present in the sea spray aerosols. And also for the calcium, we found how the calcium can be increased as well. Okay, I'm gonna leave you with just a couple of uh, teaser experiments that we did on chemical herding. Um, so uh, these experiments were done as per usual, not with phytanic acid, which I spent most of my time on, but MGDG. And the reasons for that is the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement wanted the glycolipid which is more easily resourced to be done first. And so we found um, just like with phytanic acid that the MGDG glycolipid expands the monolayer when uh, carrageenan is present than when it's not. So these are the cases without, and these are the cases with carrageenan. But the interesting thing that was probably serendipity was because MGDG is not charged, charging effects are not so important. So the presence of whether you're in artificial seawater or pure water, that's the pair here without carrageenan or here with carrageenan uh, are not so important. It's really just the presence of the carrageenan. So I'll just show you what um, chemical herding looks like and then I'll, I'll close up. Uh, so if you remember, this was uh, on pure water. And remember the rapid spreading of oil on that so-called sea surface. This is now with um, a surface pressure of 35 millinewtons per meter. So what we do is we put the oil in its cage, the ring, and then we add MGDG to a surface pressure of 35 millinewtons per meter there is a Wilhelmy plate that's in the corner that's measuring the surface pressure. And so given the values of the oil air tension, oil water tensions, we know that this surface pressure, this reduction in tension is enough to compress the layer. And so when the oil ring, the ring holding the oil is pulled up, you can see that contraction. And so the contraction is not stupendous. Um, the measures for it are on the bottom, but I don't, don't you worry about that. But you know what the important thing is? The important thing is that it's steadfast. And so this MGDG monolayer, we've done some more now with phytanic acid, um, are stable. If you were to take a soluble surfactant and add it to the surface, um, yes, the same effect would occur, but then that soluble surfactant would start to dissolve in the sublayer, which in the sea surface is infinite, and it would dilute its effect. But this surfactant present on this surface here, because it's an insoluble surfactant, has steadfastly keeps its um, surface pressure and keeps this so-called oil spill localized. I want to show you one last one is that when you don't uh, lower the pressure enough, if you don't add enough MGD sheets, so now the surface pressure is 10 millinewtons per meter, not enough to hold it what happens, and this is like a lesson in interfacial chemistry, is that when the ring is pulled up, the oil layer expands. It doesn't expand forever. It expands until it compresses 
the monolayer that is around it to the surface pressure just to balance the surface pressures due to the oil air and oil water tension. And then this shape then is retained for a long amount of time. Um, our last experiments are going to be we're, are being done at uh, 41 millinewtons per meter. This is the one that gives the most stable. And so these are the ones that um, we're starting to do experiments um, with the wave tanks at the Cold Regions Research Laboratory on this particular concentration. So I guess that uh, that's all I have to say. I know I went overboard a little bit. Um, the funding for this was uh, the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative at first and then the National Science Foundation. And of course, I want to thank Ken Matt Cars and uh, Wei especially for his help with both doing the experiments and doing the theory and truly helping and mentoring uh, the graduate students who are forever grateful.